is the truth? Where do we find the truth? In the word of God. That's where we find out what truth is. This is where we find out if our theology lines up with God's truth. And that's when he remembers that he was supposed to put that microphone over on that side. Have to give me one more second, please. So I, I want to uh, start off today by by just uh, letting us know that there is a strong belief in God uh, in the United States. Uh, one of the one of the surveys that I checked out this this past week uh, that focused in on a survey that was done just this last year. Uh, what they what the result of that survey shared was that 53 percent of of the people in America that, that based on the survey, right, that they know that God exists and they have no doubts. Uh, and then, and then as the survey continued, it said 18% of the people in the, in the U.S. believe that God exists, but have doubts. And so now I'm guessing that probably between those two categories deals with a lot of people in this room as well. Um, and then they also mentioned that there's 4% that, that believe in God, but only sometimes because they have serious doubts about, about what is going on with it. And, and so you get this idea that, that again, based on a survey and how people are responding to this survey, uh, you know, if you were to do the math, about 75% of the people in the United States believe in God in some way, shape, or fashion uh, th- that he exists. Um, some people are incredibly confident about it. Some people are somewhat confident. And some people really aren't a whole lot confident, but, uh, but maybe God does exist. Another survey that I looked at this week uh, said that 68% of the people in the United States identify as Christian. And so, so what is a Christian? It's somebody who acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came and he died on the cross for our sins and rose again. All right, so 68%, a little over two-thirds of the United States, according to the survey, um, believe or identify that they are Christian. And, and so I'm thinking through this, um, and, and then the question that comes to my mind is, that there seems to be a disconnect because if there are three quarters of our population believe that God exists, two thirds of our population um, identify as Christian, why in the world is the morality and the ethical nature of our country seem to be dwindling? That's the question I began to ask myself. What, what is it that, that we are saying that we believe in and really is it impacting the life around us? Does what we believe show wherever we go? And so, so I, you know, as I was thinking about it, I start thinking, here's what we as a country or as we as a people or even we as Christians, we, we want to blame somebody in all of this. Where is the, where's the problem in this? And here's what I think we're doing. A lot of, a lot of us are just looking at the political party we don't agree with and we blame them. Because, because the, 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 the morality of the, of the nature is, or, or of, the, of the country is in decline. We, we will often blame social media. I mean, look what goes on on social media and how crazy bad that can be. It's social media's fault, right? We'll, we'll blame TV or, or streaming, uh, you know, because we now have the ability to have, co- you know, content and any content at any time that we want. And, and our kids do as they, as they wander around and navigate this world as well. It must be, it must be TV's fault in this. I mean, isn't, isn't this what we do? Is, is we just look for somebody to blame for the issue. And what I want to submit to us today is something that I think James, as he wrote the book of James, was trying to submit to the people back then, is I think I know who we can blame. And, and, and it's not the opposing party. It, it is not social media. It is not TV. It is not our school systems. It's me. It's the individual. So, so you all can't point your finger at me and say, oh, Justin's the problem. Good. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. No, no. It, the, the issue is, is I believe that it is the individual's responsibility to behave in the way that they are supposed to. 
And, and, and even if you have family around, even if you have people that are strongly influencing you and telling you what to say, even if social media or media is influencing you, you still make the decisions of what you are going to do. I mean, a lot of us understand this. You know, my hope is that our kids never defy us, but they do. And what does that tell us? Honestly, that they are going to make their own decisions as well. And therefore, they are responsible for their actions as well. Now, we might be as responsible too, right? But every individual makes their own decisions on how they're going to act. Are there influences? Yes. But once the action takes place, it's the responsibility of the individual. And why does our world then look so bad if each and every individual is responsible for their actions and two-thirds of the United States says they believe in Jesus Christ? Three-quarters of our country believes in God. Why is morality in decline? That's my opinion. Well, the passage of Scripture that we're we're looking into today as we're continuing this message series called Faith on Display, uh, with James, uh, who many believe to be the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, he, he gives his life to Christ, trusts in him later on in life after Jesus rises again from the dead, and, and now he believes that Jesus truly is God. And so he gives his life to him. He ends up becoming a leader in the early church. And and in the midst of this time, uh, there's a whole bunch of people who, who you know, have now given their lives to Christ, but they are scattered throughout this whole area that is strongly influenced by Greek culture. And what does that mean? Well, the Greek culture was known for, for two things, a, a, a whole litany of gods, all kinds of them that they, that they, could, that they could honor and support and worship. And, and I'm going I'm to worship this god. You're going to support worship that god. Fine, you go ahead and do that. And everyone got to pick kind of which gods they were going to do. And with whatever's going on, we may focus in on another god. And the second thing that the Greek culture was known for was how self-serving it was. That really it was all about what I wanted, what I thought I needed, and that's what I could go for. Which sounds a lot like our culture today. And now uh, you've got these Christians that are living with this type of influence over their lives. And there's not a whole lot of support behind them and around them. And, and, and now, so, so what they're doing is, is they're succumbing to the pressure of, of the culture around them. And James now writes a letter that he hopes gets passed around to every single Christian scattered abroad to remind them, and not just remind. If you've been here the last couple weeks, what you realize is James doesn't pull any punches. He just hits it right each and every time and does not try to make you feel good about it at all. Why? Because we need to hear the truth. And so we talked about how even in the difficult times, most of these people that he was writing to were lower class or lower middle class in that area. And, and so they, the struggle of, of accepting what the, the, the culture around us is doing had to have been a lot of pressure. And James writes to them and says, even in tough times, you know what? Your faith should be on display. What you believe is what you should be standing for. Even in the relationships that you, that you come in contact with, whether it's new people or people that you've known for a long time or specifically talks about other people that you you connect with in the church, your faith is to be on display when you are connecting with them. And now he starts to talk about our actions. And so, Lord, as we begin to look at what James is trying to teach the people and, and us as well, God, as we are a part now of the scattered abroad, God, help us to accept this very strong word from you. And God, open our eyes to uh, the truth of who we are, where we are at. God, what I believe in and what that looks like lived out in my life. And help us all to experience a, a, a little bit of that today as we dig into your word. May the words that I share and the things that we all hear, God, may they be acceptable and pleasing to you. For you are a rock and our blessed Redeemer. Amen. So James is continuing this letter to the group of people, and now we're, we're part way through chapter 2. When he, start, when he says to people, he says, What good is it 
And, and so, so the word good here is, is he's saying, so, so what's the value? What is the benefit? And so be thinking benefit every time you hear this word good. So what's going to be the benefit, my brothers and sisters? So it's, it's people who have given your lives to Christ already. And we have to remember that because sometimes we confuse that and we think that these are things we have to do in order for God to love us, in order for God to accept us. And that is not true. God loves you. And God invites you to be in a relationship with him through what his son did to deal with our sin. And now James is writing to these people that that have made the decision. I I give my life to you, Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again for my sins. Please forgive me. These people have done that. And and now James is is trying to write to those people who have said, I'm Christian. I'm I'm living for him. And, And he says, what good is it? What is the benefit, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds. And so, so now when we're talking about the word faith here, I, I just want to give us a, a something to be thinking about all the way through because what faith is talking about here is an intellectual commitment. All right. In my head, I have thought this through and I have made this decision that this is what I believe. Okay. So do we understand what faith is? Something that's gone on where I thought about this and yes, this is what I'm, uh, this is what I'm committing to. This is what I'm saying out loud. So now what good is it to have this intellectual commitment uh, in your brain, but you do not have deeds or actions. What's, what's the benefit of thinking that you believe something, but not actually acting out on it? Can that type of faith save them? Now, again, the word save here, it confuses us, or it can, it can confuse us because we think it's being saved from lost to found. But really what's, be, what's what, what James is talking about here is can it save us from the oppression of the culture that is living around you? Can, can somebody who, who thinks about something but doesn't act on it, is that going to help them in the culture around them? And, and this just continues to go back to James one twenty one. And I know that I've said this each and every week now, but, but with the reminder here of, of what James is saying is, is, here's what the followers of Jesus are to do, right? Now, now we've given our lives to Christ, and the world around us is seeking to influence us. We are the ones who commit to getting rid of the moral filth in our life, getting rid of the evil that is so prevalent around us, right? And, and we humbly accept what God's word says to us, what, what the word plays in you, because that's what can save you from an oppressive culture around you. The thing that saves us, God's word, because that's how we know who Jesus is, is the thing that saves us in the culture that we live in. And so, so now what James is saying is, can we have an intellectual commitment to Christ and not act? Will that actually save us from the pressures of the culture around us? A whole lot of rhetorical questions here. I don't expect you to yell out no, right? But hopefully in your head, you've been thinking no. And James starts to give an example or continues because remember, he's continuing to give examples here. He says, suppose a brother or sister uh, is without clothes or daily food. And so the image here is, is, is you all are gathering at church, right? And, and last week we talked about a rich person, a poor person comes in. How, how are we going to treat them? Well, you know, how are we going to connect with them? But now somebody else is coming into the body and, and, and you look at them and they clearly look like they need help. Right? They, they, they lack clothing, uh, they lack daily food, and, and so somebody comes in like that, and, and, if, and if one of you or one of us were to say to them, go in peace, right? keep warm, well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what's, what's the benefit of that? What's the benefit of somebody that you come in contact with who needs help, especially in the body of Christ, because that's what he's talking about right here. And you just say, man, I hope things work out for you. Is there benefit in that? Is there benefit in, in, in knowing that something needs to be done and not acting on it? What good is that? What benefit is it? And in the same way, he says, faith by itself, this intellectual commitment by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, the word dead here, it means useless, it means lifeless, it means unable to save, which is one of the things that he's talking about. The, the culture around you is pressing in, and, and you're starting to believe some of the stuff that, they, that they're saying is okay for, for the followers of Jesus. Well, if, if you're just going to intellectually commit to the fact that I, I know Jesus, I, I give my life to Jesus, and yet you're not going to act, 
then what's going to happen as a result of your life is useless, lifeless, and it will not save you. I mean, it's, for me, it's the idea of a gas can, right? That's what this is. It's a gas can. What do you usually put in a gas can? Hey, pretty great, bright group we have here today. Super impressed that you knew the answer to that. Yeah, what we put in a gas, a gas can is gas. And why do we put gas in a gas can? <laughs> it's so funny because what I hear is wah, 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 wah. Right? Yes, Miss Sophomore. Yeah, what we do is we put gas in it because we need to put something in a car or a truck or a tractor or a lawnmower or whatever it is because we need that lawnmower or that car to start moving, to start acting. And so we fill this with gas, we bring it home, we put it in whatever, whatever we're putting it into with the hope that it activates that vehicle to act and perform the thing that it is supposed to be doing. So then here's my question. If this gas can does not have gas in it, what's its value? It's not a whole lot of value. You know what I call this? I call this advertisement. Hey, gas can. That's it. Because there's no value to it. There is nothing, if there is no gas in there, that can be used to activate something that needs to be activated. And so then this becomes the image, what I think James is trying to let us know, is that we are called to not just be gas cans, not just be advertisement, but to be activated into the life that God has called us through, through Jesus Christ. And that is how we get saved from the influences of the world that are pressing in on us and are causing the morality to decline all around us. A faith not backed up by our actions, it's a useless faith. And again, James, he he doesn't try to make people really feel good as much as he just tries to remind them, no, this is the truth, people. I spent most of my life not believing that Jesus was the Son of God, James is saying. And he is, and that changed everything in my life. And I think it's supposed to for all of us. That's what James is telling people. He said, and so then he starts to give some examples. Some, someone will say, right, you have faith, I have deeds, so you have this intellectual commitment, right, uh, and somebody else uh, has their actions, and he says, well, 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 show me your intellectual commitment without any action. How, how do you know that the, that the person actually believes what they believe? D- can we tell just because they've said it? Again, the rhetorical answer is No. And James says, and I will show you my intellectual commitment by my actions. The only way that somebody is going to know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ is if you live the way that Jesus Christ is calling you to live, which is different than what the world says. And James says that's the only way that they're going to know, and it's the only way that you are not going to be influenced by the culture around you. Is it just an intellectual commitment? Or is there action that's involved in it as well? And he says, you believe that there is one God, right? You have this thing that you've committed to your head, to your memory, right? He says, great. Awesome. Wow. And he says, even the demons believe. So even the enemies of God in the spiritual world believe in God. But there's something about those demons. He says, they don't just believe. They shudder. Now, there's, there's two different uh, approaches to what this word shudder means when it comes to the scholars. One is, is that you take it at face value, that, that they have this incredible amount of terror because they realize that the true power in all of creation, in all of the world, is God. That's where it came from. That's where creation came from. And because that's where it all comes from, that I should be scared if I'm not doing or acknowledging what he says. I should be terrified because I'm going to be separated from God for eternity. He said, he said, that's one of the reasons that, that the demons shudder. But the other one is the one that I find a little more interesting. Because, because what some scholars will say is, is, is this shudder is an actual physical response to their belief in God. 
And it's like James might be challenging the world to say, even the demons have an actual physical response to God, and yet some of us don't. <sighs> James, stop punching me so hard. But that's what, he's, that's what he's doing. He doesn't want us to waste time in our lives. Even the demons are going, willing to respond to what they believe in when it comes to God. Not for a way that's helpful to them, but they're responding. James is saying, how come we're not responding? And he says, you foolish person. And he's not talking about the person that's reading it. He's talking about the person who says, I can have faith without action. I can have this intellectual commitment without doing something. He says, that's the foolish person in this. And he says, you foolish person, do you want uh, evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Do you, is, that, is that what you want? Do you, do you want some sort of proof that, that, that faith without action uh, is not going to be a benefit to our lives? It's lifeless. It does not save. And, and so that's the challenge. And here's what I think. I think we live in a world, although the morality is decreasing, right? I think we live in a world that, do, that does want people to follow through on the things that they say they believe in. I really, really do. Now, we, we may believe very different things, but, but I don't even know how to deal with someone if, if they're not going to follow through on the things that they believe. Hey, let me give you some examples, right? Uh, j- recently, uh, last year, if, if that's recently, there was a congressman who was standing strong, uh, w- you know, with a pro-life stance. She's just really huge into it. And then all of a sudden, his mistress gets pregnant, And he quietly tries to get her to have an abortion. And the news gets out. And the congressman ends up resigning him from his position, not because he had to, but because of the pressure of the people around him saying, you you can't stand for saying, you can't say you're pro-life if you're not really going to live out being pro-life. Or, or a very common story, uh, you know, is, is of the guy in Stockholm who went to the, the police station and he said, I am sick and tired of the people speeding through my neighborhood. Can't you do something about that? And the very next day, the, the police set up a speed trap in his neighborhood and a bunch of people get ticketed, including the man who went to the police station to let them know that there was speeding going on in his neighborhood and something needed to stop. Well, what does that say about the guy? What was really important? That other people act the way that they're supposed to act. But I can act however I want to act. I mean, that's what it's saying. Or or the director of the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, uh, whose whose whole coalition, they they gathered together to protect certain species of animal and and the wilderness, who, who ended up getting arrested and pleading a misdemeanor charge to poaching and destruction of natural property and had to resign from his position as director. Why? Well, because he wasn't doing what he said he believed. And that's what James is really trying to hammer home with people here, is that, that we're to live out what we believe. We're to live out what God's word tells us to. I think it is such a God thing that we are doing baptism Sunday on the same Sunday that this message, which I planned six months ago to say, is happening today. Because it's people saying, I am going to live out what I say I believe. James uh, continues on and starts to give a couple more examples that they would have, that they would have understood very well. And he says, was not our father Abraham? Now, so Abraham is the forefather of their faith. You know, we often think of the, one of the forefathers of the United States as George Washington. Well, Abraham was even more significant because he was the actual literal father of their faith. And so he was a, if not one of the big deals of their faith. And was not the guy who was considered a huge, big deal in our faith, considered righteous. He was actually doing the right thing in God's eyes. That's what righteous means in the Bible. He was doing the right thing for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar, which is this crazy story where, where God says to Abraham, he said, you know, you're going to be a father of a nation. And Abraham says, I'm super old, God, that can't happen. My wife's super old, still good looking maybe, but, but that's not going to happen for her as well. God says it's going to happen. Years and years and years later, now they're 190. And then all of a sudden, she gives birth to a child. It's this crazy story. 
And so this now is the one that, that the blessing that the nations are going to come from. And then all of a sudden, at one point, God says, no, I want you to sacrifice your kid because I want you to trust me. What? That makes no sense to me. I'm guessing it made no sense to Abraham as well. But here's the thing. God told him to do it. And so he decides to do it. And it was credited for him as righteousness. Now he ends up getting Isaac on the altar and God stops him because, because God's following through on this faithful plan that he has to create a, a nation out of him. And, and so the story ends in a way that we would all love in the midst of the craziness in the middle where he, and I'm guessing we don't, didn't understand what God was wanting to do in it. What God was wanting to do is, is to try and help Abraham understand that an intellectual commitment and action are two different things that need to happen together. And can I trust you to do that? You see that when his faith and his actions were working together is what it says, right? It, it means like, like there were fellow co-workers who are working side by side, both on the same payroll, right? If one person gets fired, the other one's going to get fired as well. I mean, that's kind of the image in all of this. They were working side by side with one of them, and his faith, his intellectual commitment was made complete, brought him to maturity by what he did. It was the actions of what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. This was the result of his belief was that he was righteous. He was acting out in the way that God wanted him to be. And it says he was called God's friend. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. That that he was in such a close relationship with God that they viewed one another as friends. And it seems to be because he had this intellectual commitment that was coincided with action in trusting God as he lived for him throughout his life. You see, the scripture says that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Again and again and again. And then then James uses a a, a totally different example, way on the opposite spectrum of Abraham. So you've got the father of our nation here, right? And now let's let's talk about this prostitute lady from a different nation. And and in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute, which (laughs) everywhere in Scripture, that's what she's called, Rahab the prostitute, not Rahab, right? Rahab the prostitute. How would you like to be known as that the rest of your life? But But here she is. She's this person living in a different country who had heard the stories about what the one true God, Yahweh, God, was doing with his people. And and now uh, Moses has sent in 12 people to check out the the promised land. Is this going to be, are we going to be able to navigate through? this. And, and, and so now they're, they're in one of the cities, and, and they're about to be found. And so this prostitute lady, uh, they, you know, she, they end up in her house, and she says, I, I'll protect you. I will take care of you. I will even help you to get out of here. Do you want to know why? And, and this is what she said. Because when I heard the stories about your God, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. She's saying, I don't even know a whole lot about this God, but I know that he is the one true God. And and so I'm going to fear him, I'm going to respect him, and I'm going to try and act on his behalf in this world, even though I don't fully understand it. That's what she's saying here. When she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction which is what she did. They were able to safely go back and share what they saw of the land. And, and they made this promise to her that if you, if you leave this ribbon in your window, when we come to attack your city, anybody that's in your house, they're going to be saved, which they followed through on that commitment uh, as well. And so you see this woman who, who everyone would look at as the absolute last person that we would expect some sort of integrity and faith from, made this intellectual commitment to God and then acted on it. Isn't that such a powerful, powerful story? Then he ends this section by saying, as the body without the spirit is dead, useless, cannot save. Once the spirit leaves the body, the body is nothing. So faith without deeds, so this intellectual commitment that we have without action 
is dead, useless, and it's not going to save you in the culture that we live in. That's the challenge that James has given the people. That genuine faith is seen in our obedience to God. Now, I don't know, uh, you know, I'm guessing a lot of you have heard of this app that's called Be Real. It's, it's this kind of social media idea that, that's come up. And, and, and actually, back in August is when it, it became the number one app that was being downloaded uh, in Apple specifically in the thing that I was reading. Right? The idea behind the Be Real app is that, is that at random times during the day, as best I understand it, um, you are going to be informed by this app that it's time to take a picture. And what you, what you do is you have two minutes uh, in order to take a picture. And, and so you don't have time to put on filters or to arrange your environment or make sure that you're all prettied up for the picture. We just want a real picture of who you are and what you're doing at that time. So you have two minutes in order to take a picture. And, and when you take the picture, the cameras on both sides of the phone take a picture at the same time. So it's a picture of who you are and where you are or what you're doing. And then it gets shared to, the, to your friends. And one of the really cool things is, is if you don't take a picture in those two minutes, you don't get to see what your friends are taking pictures of as well. Because if I'm going to be real, this is the idea behind it. If I'm going to be real, I want my friends to be real as well. And and so in this culture where we, many of us, spend a, a crazy amount of time making sure that our Facebook posts say exactly what they want them to say or as, as, as funny as they can be so I can get the responses uh, that, that I have all the right pictures and I have all the right videos done so that people will respond to me in a way that like, makes me feel good about myself. We've gone from that where we're taking Instagram photos, uh, where we're taking Snapchat stuff, where, where, where we're just trying to show people really kind of how awesome we are and how present we are in this world uh, to a group of people in our world who are saying, no, I just want to see people really as they are. And so friends, I think there is a culture around us that is crying out for people to be real. And it will continue to be immoral and unethical. And yet God is calling us in this seemingly impossible environment to believe in him and act on the things that he says we're called to do. Because that type of faith on display is what's going to matter in this world. And so as we close, I, I really want to challenge you to not just hear a message, but think about what you're going to do about it. What am I going to do about this? You know, if, if, I, if I were to ask you, you know, how can I, or ask yourself, how can I put my faith into action? How can I put this intellectual commitment into doing something? What would that look like in my home? What what would that look like in my community or at work or at school? If I were to put my faith into action at school, what would it look like? What's something that I could do? Pick one thing that you know that God is calling you to because he calls all of us to. It's in his word if you don't know. And and what am I going to do to put my faith into action? What am I going to do to put my faith into action with the church, with our brothers and sisters in Christ? I got to let you know, I I initially thought uh, about just letting you know something, something really simple that everyone could do to take a nice small step to say, hey, you know, we have this pantry here and we really could use some peanut butter and spaghetti and some sauce and some cereal and some ravioli type stuff, you know, you know, meal in a cans type stuff. And I thought "Ah, I could just let people know that and they could do that. But then I thought, no, because here's what's going to happen is there's going to be people, (laughs) you know, people who really truly do care, who will bring some stuff in and feel like they've put their faith into action. And James is saying, no, this is how we live our lives. So what are you going to do? What am I going to do to put my faith into action? Who do I need to support at home? Who do I need to befriend in my community or at school or at work or at church? What can I do? Who needs to see God's faith in action around you. Lord, help us to know what the answer to that is. That, that, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but that we would do what it says. Oh God, this is so convicting for me, so challenging for me to even think about. 
Help me, God, and help all of us to make a decision today to know you, but then live it out. God, help me to know what specifically you are calling me to do. And may that be the prayer for each and every one of us. And friends, if we don't know, then just look at something that God's word says, and I invite you to do it. And if you don't know what that is, I invite you to come back or I invite you to check out a small group that's looking into God's word so that we can do it. Lord, on behalf of these people, we are yours. And so help us to know you and live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's message. We hope you found it both encouraging and helpful. If you did, please click the like button and share with your friends. If you want to hear when new messages are posted, please subscribe to The Benton Church. We also invite you to join us on site for worship. We're located in Benton, Kansas, just east of Wichita. Our Sunday services start at 1030 and our doors are open to everyone. For more information, please check out our website at thebentonchurch.org. What do you know about God? He loves us. He died for our sins. He helps us. He's powerful. And he loves you.